Good afternoon. Um, is the microphone? Okay. All right. <laughs> Pedro Reyes engages with the forms and principles of Mexico City's modernist architecture to revise their utopian underpinnings. Using abandoned or dilapidated architecture as a point of departure, he creates multi-participatory -part artworks that direct audiences to examine the productive relation between art, design, and social process. Through education and collective performance, participants in many different stages of his artworks can envision plausible as opposed to utopic plans for improving society locally and globally. Today I will focus on Ray's project, Parque Vertical, for which he intervenes in the ruins of Tlatelolco, a defunct housing project in Mexico City designed and built by modernist architect Mario Pani in the 60s. So on the left is a photograph of one of Ray's original components of this multi-part project, um, for which he transforms the design of Pani's most distinctive tower at the complex, the Torre Insignia. The monumental structures built here at Tlate Loco by Pani still stand as vestiges of a bold, ostentatious, and miserably failed modernist project. I will explain why the utopian aspirations of Pani's scheme led to its demise and show how Ray's project imagines the transformation of Tlate Loco's ruins through the site's most iconic structure, the Torre Insignia, into a collectively maintained ecological project. As I will show, Reyes tackled the ideological problem of Tlaté Local's architecture through various visual, pedagogical, and participatory components that build on the optimism of utopia, but conceptualize plausible plans for renewal. Furthermore, I will probe how Reyes goes beyond critiquing ideology by extending this project into the realm of real, lived experience. Specifically, I will question whether the educational component of his work, realized through exhibitions, lectures, and publications, promotes real and ongoing learning and discourse. Lastly, I will propose the culmination of this project in an improvised collective performance piece successfully engage the local community, community in the artist's goal of transforming the culture of violence plaguing Mexico City's struggling neighborhoods. The residential complex at Tlate Loco emblematizes the relationship between mass scale implementation of urban residential architecture and top down control. It stands vacant in Mexico City as a dark reminder of how modernist architecture and urban planning serve the machinations of a corrupt government. And this is an aerial pho photograph of the complex from 1968. This is the Plaza of Three Cultures. You can see here in the lower left the ruins of an ancient Aztec temple, um, a colonial structure, and Pani surrounded this with his modernist um, high rises. This is important um, to the ideological component of this um, complex, as you'll see. In its original conception by Pani, Tlate Loco was the ideal solution for replacing urban slums with efficient, orderly housing for thousands of inhabitants. He believed that the only way to improve modern living was to raise poor areas and to rebuild, thereby changing social conditions through architecture. But Pani was working from an abstract notion of modernity, emphasizing homogeneity, monumentality, and rigid order. Ideas that were disconnected from the richly diverse social fabric of the pre-existing <coughs> neighborhoods. These are the residential towers. <coughs> the Torre Insignia is an abandoned, triangular, high-rise structure that is the centerpiece of Tlate Loco. It is the tallest building for the residential complex and represents a modernist interpretation of the Aztec pyramid that stands in ruins on the site. Pani intended to unify grand narratives of ancient and modern Mexico with this tower. Its austere, gleaming geometric structure projected the legendary glory of Mexico City's ancient past 
for a monumental modernist design. In other words, this structure expressed the belief in a progressive future built on the foundations of a mythic heroic past. By the 1980s, Sante Loco had degenerated into a slum and had earned its reputation as a modernist ruin, a symbol of everything that was wrong with modernist urban planning in Mexico City. The darkest moment in the history of Tlatelolco was the tragic government-led massacre of protesters on the evening of October 2nd, 1968. A traumatic event in Mexico's national history that exposed the government's false commitment to public education, improved widespread living, and democracy. On that date, just 10 days prior to the commencement of the Olympic Games, Government troops surrounded 10,000 student-led government protesters in the central plaza of the housing project and opened fire on the crowd. Although the government denied charges of the massacre, it's estimated that more than 300 people died, while even more were wounded or unjustly jailed. Following the tragic events of 1968, Tate Lopo no longer offered a better future for Mexicans, but instead stood as a haunting memorial to the government's abuse of power. This perception was reinforced when in 1985, a magnitude 8.1 earthquake struck Mexico City and reduced much of the complex to rubble, exposing flawed engineering, use of poor construction materials, and corruption on the part of the government and Pani himself. The Torre Insignia is one of only a few of Pani's buildings at the site that didn't either collapse or require demolition due to flawed engineering or poor, poor construction materials, but it sustained enough damage to be condemned. Although it had become a symbol of dystopia, the Torre Insignia appealed to Reyes as the initial format for another urban renewal scheme. At the Mexico City-based architectural studio, Celula Arquitectura, Reyes and architect Jorge Covarrubias devised a plan for transforming the Torre Insignia into a model for institutional and collective collaboration and ecological sustainability in architecture, keeping in mind how the structure could evolve to meet, to meet the changing needs of the locals over time. The humanist and ecological goals of this project are to use architecture as a means to bring people into a productive relationship with their natural surroundings. Reyes set out to transform the age tower from an emblem of lost optimism into an example of a practical design for sustainable urban ag agriculture. He entitled the project Parque Vertical because it uses the form of the triangular high-rise to accommodate the growth of a large-scale hanging garden and the efficient functioning of a self-contained irrigation system. As it was explained through drawings, architectural models, such as the one you see on the left, and printed materials, Parque Vertical takes this architectural icon as a structure and ideological void and uses it as a format for an aesthetically interesting green technology that could improve urban living on a broad scale. Parque Vertical was large in scope, involving the display of several visual components in exhibitions and on his website, such as um, what you see on the left, aerial photographs of how it appears currently, sticking out amidst the urban sprawl, um, photographs of the original tower under construction to reveal its lattice structure, which is very important to the design of Ray's hanging garden. Also, architectural models or drawings and maquettes of the tower with its exterior stripped to show a lattice structure filled with green sculptural forms and botanical elements. Ray's description of the project, printed for exhibition, highlights the cultural significance of the tower and his plans for its transformation, which include artistic, engineering, and social concerns, and a plan to disseminate information broadly. 
As his architectural drawings and simulations show, the concept involved the development of a green skyscraper in which nearby residents could grow their own food on the interior lattice structure, composed of supporting columns that slant at angles of 70 degrees. In order to create the hanging garden, the building would be divided into hundreds of hydroponic units, fed by an irrigation system in which water pumps would be powered by energy, derived from solar panels, that would cover the western and eastern facades of the building. Pani had reserved large tracts of space for green areas in his original design, and these have increased since the earthquake because gardens have been planted where buildings collapsed. Ray's concept, therefore, feeds into this growing relationship between ruins and gardens in Tlatelolco. The transformation of the Torre Insignia is not to be realized. Although Ray has generated widespread interest in potential green renovation projects, by publishing the plans frequently in newspapers and magazines as, quote, World Environment Education Center, Parque Vertical is also, was also significant within the art world, informing a collective project held at New York's new museum, entitled Museum as Hub, Tlate Loco, and the Localized Negotiation of Future Imaginaries. This event featured works by seven international artists, as well as film screenings, artist talks, workshops, and discussion groups, addressing Tlate Loco as a potential model for urban renewal embracing collective ideals, not just for Mexico City, but for a densely populated, globalized world. Um, all the artists gave lectures and hosted workshops, but this is a um, documentary photograph of the installation of um, Ray's piece at the New Museum. While the grandness of Ray's scheme seems to idealize his vision, he did have a practical goal in mind, which was to inspire dialogue about how to advance art in the realm of urban renewal through his mass-mediated public initiative. This leads us to the question, does this initiative succeed in bringing about real learning, or is it too a utopian ideal? Art historian Claire Bishop has written on this problem inherent to projects that aspire to function as both art and education, and argues that in order to bring about real learning, the artwork must reach a broad second audience of viewers after the fact. She believes that the most successful examples of pedagogy as art implement, quote, modes that are time-based or performative. These, unquote, these may include video, exhibitions, lectures, or publications, any format that can reach secondary audiences, which, according to Bishop, quote, are essential, since it keeps open the possibility that um, everyone can learn something from these projects. It allows specific instances to become generalizable. Everyone can learn something, or ev I'm sorry, establishing a relationship between particular and universal. Bishop describes these successful art education endeavors as, quote, useful art. I argue that Parque Vertical attempts to meet the requirements of useful art because it ensures the perpetuity of dialogue through printed materials and the exhibition of representations of the ephemeral projects. Furthermore, the public education initiative not only extends the artwork beyond a singular moment of education, it also reaches beyond art-going audiences with the goal of inspiring plans and models for combined artistic and social innovation. The dissemination of information was only the starting point. Reyes developed his concept for revitalizing <laughs> Tante Loco in different media and social arenas that allow for the possibility of active participation in performance, specifically through works that address the culture of violence in Tante Loco and surrounding neighborhoods. Instant Rockstar was one intervention inspired by his work for Parque Vertical as a space for uninhibited and liberating creative expression of rock music fans who gather regularly in El Tianguis del Chopo Street Market near Tlatelolco. This particular project sought to include people in his agenda by mediating rather than changing their familiar environments and activities. 
He created an improvised collective performance space where young amateur rock musicians informally gathered on Saturdays. <laughs> the art objects seen here consist of a series of multi-density fiberboard sculptures in the shape of electric guitars, each expressing a different rock star persona, like um, as Ray's described, space rock, death thrash, or glam and several of which he displays in exhibitions along with video documentation of the performance component. These guitar sculptures superseded the status of autonomous art objects, however, when they served as props and even as objects that participants could act out upon in their expressive performances. For example, participants could choose the song and guitar that suited their style. And Reyes would alter the sound system and color background of the makeshift stage to accommodate their mode. The performance itself was similar to karaoke with a guitar prop, but ended in what Reyes described as, quote, the ultimate rock star fantasy, the cathartic ritual of smashing the guitar into pieces. The point of this final destructive act, he stated, was to create a space in which violence was an exercise of style. In this way, Reyes was making an effort to engage non-art-going audiences, but people who live in the neighborhoods, to help them explore ways of transforming violence from pure destruction into cathartic and creative expression. Reyes' strategy draws influence from Joseph Boy's ideal of social sculpture or the idea that a better society could be shaped by inciting the creative potential in every individual. Boyce made this concept famous through his four-week lecture performance, Art into Society, Society into Art, at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London in 1974, for which he conducted daily eight-hour lectures, during which he drew on three separate blackboards propped up on easels. Boyce filled the blackboards with impulsive, imaginative chalk drawings, as well as written statements and shorthand notations on how art can affect society, therefore creating a specific learning environment and a visual informational product of the event. Reyes claims that social sculpture guides the participatory component of his work and acknowledges Boyce's combined use of the playful and the symbolic for inspiring his own strategy of using specific materials and forms to catalyze participation. But Reyes downplays the performative role of the artist educator and replaces this with the active impromptu participation of viewers' students. While Boyce's pedagogical project blurred the line between education and one-man performance, Reyes, by contrast, allows participants to assume this central role collectively. In Ray's work, unique performative experiences continue to develop in the form of new performances inspired by the original artwork, but in different contexts, in order to continue challenging particular social and institutional structures. This one's shown here um, at um, the USF Contemporary Art Museum. Performance, therefore, fulfills both a local and universal educational agenda in Ray's work. In conclusion, there must be a space for critical reflection and spectatorial position in participatory art, which Ray's provides through program content. Viewer participation is structured by publications, activities, workshops, and documents, and artifacts of the performances. It's mediated by the aesthetic form, artistic and cultural history, and the ideological basis of Tlatelolco. The educational component of the work is comprised through collaboration and exchange with the first audience of students and participants, and then viewer students who can interpret and carry on the social agenda of the project beyond Tlatelolco. This results in an open relation of learning and creating among participants and viewers, with one another and with Reyes. Reyes explained that his intention is to create plans, quote, that have potential to be replicated and that are sustainable and that have agency in the world. 
He continued, quote, I am more interested in agency, and utopia by definition does not have agency. It means it cannot happen or that it doesn't exist, unquote. Ray's definition of art with social agency complements the agenda of many artists experimenting with participatory practice today. He finds meaning in the integration of art and social process and the simultaneous employment of creativity in both realms. Rather than using art to envision or to simulate an ideal for a future that is always out of reach. Thank you.